It's good to see all of you this morning. The word of the Lord from John chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, with the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here and stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy the temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Now, After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. And they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. In this passage in John 2, we encounter a striking scene where Jesus cleanses the temple. At first glance, this seems like some simple act of purification, right? Um, At most, I think we use this passage these days to try to justify our own self-righteous anger. Right? Anytime that you feel particularly perturbed about something and someone says you shouldn't be angry about that, you can always play the Jesus card and say, well, Jesus got angry and cleaned out the temple, so I can be angry about this. That's, that's where this passage usually shows up. But it's more than that. In this story, there's also a deeply profound revelation, a revelation that challenges the very essence of worship, for not only the people as the time that they knew it, but also for people of all time. In this passage, we witness Jesus disrupting the order of the temple, overturning tables, driving out those who bought and sold. But his actions go beyond a mere cleansing. See, they signify a seismic shift in the understanding of worship itself. The temple once revered as the holiest of places. It's, it's the focal point of Jewish worship, but it's so much more than that. This, this temple is God's throne room. This is where God is. If you want to go be with God during this day and this time where Jesus is cleansing the temple, you go to the temple. That's where God sits on the throne on earth. And now suddenly, All of that finds itself overshadowed by the presence of Jesus. The problem at hand is not just about the physical state of the temple or or the activities within its wall. The problem isn't the selling and the buying. Yeah, that's a problem, but it's deeper than that. That's, That's symptomatic of something else. It's about recognizing a deeper truth unveiled by his actions that that Jesus is now the center of worship, not the temple. Yes, the buying, the selling, those things shouldn't have been happening, but he's challenging so much more than that. He's telling them, this used to be your temple, now I am temple. I am the center of worship. So you can tear this temple down, and I will rebuild it in three days. And they just they cannot fathom a person being the center of worship. It just doesn't make sense. This revelation, it it poses a challenge to the religious structures, the practices, everything that had become so entrenched in the lives of the people. And it's tempting to say that that was their problem, not our problem. We don't have temple-centric worship, so we don't have to worry about these things. But I think we still have to come to terms with this profound shift. We still have to embrace... Jesus as this new center of worship, when for so long, even for us, our focus has always seemed to be gravitated towards 
external rituals and traditions. And despite living in an era that's vastly different than that of Jesus in the temple in Jerusalem, we still struggle with the same challenges in different ways regarding the essence of true worship. We often seek to find some sort of meaning in external structures. When, when we try to take control and order life, we, we grab hold of anything that we can to try to make sure that we have control of something. When, when everything seems out of control in our lives, we like to control things around us. And that includes worship. It always has. Whether we're talking Martin Luther or we're talking you and me today, there's this need that we seem to have to want to control the aspects of what we do in worship, to have it be orderly and predictable in some way, shape, or form. We look for meaning in external structures in our worship, and I I don't mean the building itself. I mean what we do week after week, be it the be it the structure, be it the elaborate places that we do worship or the rituals or the age-old traditions, we tend to expect certain things out of worship, much like the people in the temple seem to expect certain things out of worship then. They expected buying and selling of animals for sacrifices. We don't expect that, but we still expect a few songs, a couple of prayers, a sermon. We still have expectations of what worship is and isn't. Perhaps we have more expectations of what worship isn't than what it is. We can spot what's wrong faster than we can what's right. That tends to definitely be true throughout history. And with all these elements in play, we can it can undoubtedly serve as some kind of conduit for spiritual connection. Yes, we find meaning in the things that we do in worship, the practices that we keep and those that we don't. We we find a connection there, and that's good. But there's a lurking danger behind it. We can unwittingly elevate all of those external rituals and things and traditions above the essence of worship itself, which has always been rooted in this deeply personal relationship with Christ. You see, he is the center of worship, not the things that we do. So the danger lies in the existence of these structures and practices, but also in our propensity to prioritize them over encountering Jesus. It's easy to get caught up in the routine of religious observance, taking off check boxes of rituals performed or traditions upheld, all the while missing the center of worship. In this way, we risk reducing worship to a mere routine, a series of motions, often devoid of genuine connection or transformation, and we become more concerned with the form rather than the substance. And we make we mistake religious activity for spiritual health and vitality. If we can just do the right things week after week, that counts, whether or not you actually involve Jesus. How much is Jesus a part of our worship? How much was he a part of the worship in the temple? You see, that might have been more upsetting to him than the buying and the selling of the things. They just didn't understand that worship involves two parties, the people and God. And they had removed God from the worship, from the temple, from the very throne room on earth. They just had bypassed all the God business and gotten on with the routines, the traditions, the the things they had to do. So the relevance of this problem becomes apparent. How do we avoid falling into the trap of running worship into a mere checklist or routine? How do we ensure that our focus can remain squarely on encountering Christ rather than getting lost in the trappings of our own traditions? These questions are the ones we don't want to talk about. We don't want to go there. It makes everyone uncomfortable. But it beckons us to examine our own hearts, our own practices, invites us to reorient ourselves and our understanding of worship and realign ourselves with the essence of what it truly means to worship Christ. And what initially appears to be a dramatic scene of cleansing of sellers and buyers and animals in the temple, well, that itself is a symbolic 
representation of a new era, this shift in understanding of the nature of worship. In the dwelling place of God, the temple, the dwelling place of God is now not that ornate building. Now it is this person from Nazareth. That is where God is. That is where you go to encounter God. And it's mobile. He moves around a lot. And he's often found in unexpected places. Temple was predictable. You knew exactly what it was, where it was, how long it was going to be open, when you were allowed to go in and out, what you had to do to go in and out, and what you had to bring with you. Everything was a controlled environment. But Jesus is not controlled, is not predictable, and often does things you wished he wouldn't, and goes places you definitely think he shouldn't. That was a dramatic change for these people. This act of cleansing the temple, it's not merely an assertion of authority. It's not just a purification of physical space. This is a proclamation of fundamental truth. And overturning those tables and driving out those buyers and sellers, Jesus points beyond the physical temple itself to himself and says, I am the true dwelling place of God. And you can't do to me what you've done to temple. You can't control me like you've done this space. It doesn't work that way anymore. You see, in Jesus, God's presence finds its fullest expression. He becomes the mediator between humanity and the divine. He bridges the gap that separates us from God. God is no longer confined to the walls of a building behind a four-inch thick curtain where nobody can see him. God's presence now resides in the person of Jesus, and he might just sit down in your house and have dinner that night. It's terrifying, the idea of God being with a person. It's unthinkable. The last time God got that close to a person, it was Moses, and his face was so scary bright that people made him wear a cover over it because they just couldn't handle it. And they had a meeting with God, and they said, God, you're too close. We need you to distance yourself. Stay in this pretty little box. And Jesus is undoing all of that and says, it's time for something closer. We used to be in a garden together. Now it's time for us to be closer than that. He has shifted the center of worship by moving the location of God. That revelation is good news. It's a message of hope and liberation for anyone who would seek to worship God in spirit and truth. For the Samaritans who are told they're not allowed in the temple, Jesus is good news. On the side of the road at a well with a woman who hasn't been allowed in worship in a long time. For people who haven't been allowed in the temple because they are unclean, now Jesus eats in their home and they can worship him. They can take expensive jars of perfume and Pour them over his feet. It is good news for people who hadn't had good news in a very long time. This paradigm shift in our understanding of worship, it moves us from the external rituals and the traditions to a deeply personal encounter with Jesus. In Jesus, worship transcends religious observance. It becomes an intimate communion with the one who is the way, the truth, in the life. And through him, we are invited into a relationship with God that is characterized by grace and love and change. Oh, we don't like that. We don't like change. So the gospel, the good news in the story invites us to embrace Jesus as that center of our faith and worship. And it challenges us to let go of our preconceived notions, our religious structures, And instead, to fix our eyes on him, the author, the perfecter of our faith. And it's in the person of Jesus that we find the fulfillment of all of our longings and the true source of life and worship. And so the application of something like that for people like us today, it's it's multifaceted to say the least. I think first and foremost, it calls us to shift our focus from external things to this encounter with Christ and devotion of him. We were reminded that worship is not about the grandeur of the building or the intricacy of the rituals, but about the posture of the heart, a posture characterized by humility 
reverence and surrender before the living God. And moreover, embracing Jesus as the center of our faith requires us to recognize that he transcends all of those religious structures and traditions. He's bigger than all of that. Those are valuable tools. The things we do here are important. They're just not why we do them. These are valuable tools for spiritual growth, but they can never become substitutes for a genuine connection with Christ. Instead of clinging to the familiar comforts of religious routines, we're called to step out in faith and encounter a living Jesus in new and transformative ways. We don't come here week after week to sing a few songs and utter a couple of prayers and sleep during a sermon. We come here to encounter a living Jesus. That's why you come here. Not because he only stays here. It's not that he's confined here. This isn't just new temple, okay? We come here together to encounter Christ in a way that encourages us to stay connected with him throughout the week. This is a recharging zone. This is a reconnecting zone because our habits tend to move us away from Jesus Monday through Saturday, further and further. And this is a chance to reconnect and stay close to this new living center of worship. In this way, this gospel message challenges us to let our lives reflect the truth that Jesus is indeed the ultimate center of everything that we do. And our worship, it extends beyond the confines of sacred spaces and sacred times. Instead, it permeates every aspect of our existence, our work, our relationships, our communities, our hobbies, everything we do, all of it. As followers of Christ, we are called to embody his love, his grace, and his truth in a world that is just ever so desperate for some good news of hope or healing that we believe only Jesus could bring. In essence, I think John 2 beckons us to embrace Jesus as the ultimate center of worship and to live our lives in a manner that reflects his transformative power and love to the world around us. That is the benefit of worship that is mobile. It happens everywhere. It's not that worship can now be allowed to happen everywhere. It's that worship now happens everywhere. Regardless of if you participate, you can all be silent, but the rocks would cry out. You can all quit worshiping God, but you cannot stop the worship of God. It now takes place anywhere, always, forever. And Christians for millennia have been overwhelmed by the beauty of such an idea. It was very early on that Christians really fell in love with this concept, and here's how it happened. There's this weird couple of verses, or just a couple of sentences, or even maybe just a few words, really, in, in the book of Acts, where the disciples come into town and they go to uh, the temple to pray because it's the right time for prayer. There was a Jewish practice that there were specific hours of prayer. Typically today, we associate that with another religion. It's not ours. It's not Judaism. Set hours of prayer. But there was a time um, long before what we know where Christians embraced hourly prayers. And some still do. Um, for a while, they were called divine hours, which is just not a very catchy title, is it? Here's the concept. Okay, Around the same time that time zones were really coming into fad, when people started to really figure out that the world was moving in such a way that time was shifting with the world turning, Christians realized that they could do something really magnificently beautiful. And if there was a certain set time of prayer at noon, say you, say you pray today at noon, but what if Christians around the world always prayed at noon? Well, that means that whenever you're done praying at noon, someone else is starting to pray at their noon. And then after they're done, someone else starts over. And if we all prayed at certain times of the day at the exact same times in your time zone, again, this was thousands of years ago. This is really early on. This is some of the disciples were barely dead kind of time. Okay. This is, this is early Christianity stuff. 
they figured out that they could constantly bombard the throne room of God in prayer, worship that never ceased. And that's what they did. And it was highly encouraged that everyone would worship no matter where they were. They would drop what they were doing at those set, certain set times, and they would pray to recognize that God is still with them. Wherever they went, regardless of temple and its location, regardless of geography, in fact, because of geography, it was now possible to make sure that the throne room of God was always covered in praise and prayer. And you fast forward a few years, our worship begins at 1030 on Sunday mornings. We've lost something if that's all this is. I don't think that's all it is. But if we confine worship to Sunday mornings at 1030s, we're missing worship in small groups. Which you should be doing. It's a good thing. Find one. We have a few. Worship at those times. But if that's all that worship is, if it's only Sunday mornings and only small groups, you're missing worship during your lunch break, which you could be doing. Or worship while you're sitting in the dentist chair, which you should definitely be doing. You should definitely be praying while you're at the dentist. And good news, the temple has moved with you to the dentist. And he's there with you then too. And so Jesus prepares to ascend to heaven. And when it looks like he's going away, when it looks like temple is moving away permanently, he looks at his friends and says, don't worry, I am still with you always to the very end of the age. I go with you everywhere always. And worship never ends because your relationship with Christ never ends. It's always there. And I hope that brings you comfort. Maybe not in this moment. This moment, it's easy to find comfort. The pews are padded. Okay, it's easy to find comfort on Sunday mornings at 1030. I hope you find comfort when you have the next blow-up fight with your spouse and you try to fix it. I hope you find comfort the next time you are afraid of losing your job. I hope you find comfort whenever you're paralyzed by the fear of world wars. Because in those moments, especially, temple is still with you. This Christ, this King, this Jesus is staying with us always. And those are great times to worship. The times we need it most. Come to this table. Worship Christ, the King who is crucified and resurrected. But worship him at lunch too. And dinner and everything in between. In fact, Fall asleep while you're praying tonight so that even in your sleep, you're worshiping. There's always a time for it. There's always a place for it because Jesus walked into the temple one day and kicked everybody out and said, we're going mobile. That was a big deal. And it still is. Come here week after week, worship with us. We're glad you do. I'm more glad if you continue worshiping wherever you go next. That's more important than what we do here. Don't lose that. Hold on to it. Take what you find at this table into what you're doing tomorrow and Tuesday and Wednesday and every other day and come back next week to recharge and reconnect and keep taking your worship with you wherever you go. This is not where we come to worship. This is where we come together to encourage each other to worship where we go next. You can tear this place down and Jesus can rebuild it, but it won't look like this. It'll look, it'll look like him because he is our place of worship. He is our object of worship. He is our time of worship. He is what worship is relating to him, being one with him as he is one with God. That is worship. And it goes with you always to the end of the age. Let's stand and sing.